Thank you for being here. Um, so I'll start with a couple of uh, housekeeping notes. Uh, this webinar is being recorded, just so you know. Um, I do have the intention of sharing it with those who uh, are not able to attend it right now. Uh, so for the presenters, let me know if you do have any issues with that after the webinar is over. Um, to everyone, please mute yourself um, until it's time to talk. So for the presenters, uh, don't forget to unmute yourself when it is your presentation time. Um, using your camera is optional. I do recommend that if you're not presenting or if you're not one of the presenters, that you keep your camera off just to save on bandwidth if that's a thing. Um, so again, for presenters, uh, you will have five minutes for your presentations. They're going to be very short. There's very little flexibility in time. So please keep an eye on the time yourself. On the five minute mark, I will give you a cue. Um, and uh, shortly after, I will have to uh, ask you to definitely wrap up uh, for the interest of time. Uh, I'm going to show the slides on my computer uh, just so that transitions are smooth, hopefully. So uh, let me know when to forward slides. Uh, just give me those prompts. So um, today we have uh, a bunch of experts talking on uh, topics related to bad health uh, management research. We've got uh, speakers from uh, government, uh, from federal government, territorial government, as well as non-governmental organizations. Um, and they'll be talking about a broad range of bad health topics. So uh, you've seen in the agenda and you hear me talk about bad health, whereas usually when you hear me uh, as the White Nose Syndrome Program Coordinator talk about bats, it's in the context of White Nose. But we're really trying to shift this discussion and this focus um, to not just be about White Nose Syndrome, uh, but to encomp encompass bad health topics on a much broader scale. Um, so when we do go back 10 years, uh, White Nose Syndrome has been in Canada for 10 years now. It is very own 2010. Uh, ever since then, it's been spreading. It's now uh, east in uh, Newfoundland, on the western side of Newfoundland. West, it's gotten to Manitoba. Western Canada, as far as we know, is still unaffected. Um, but so th this different situation uh, for white nose syndrome uh, requires different management strategies. So in the east, we're really looking at population that have populations that have been devastated. We're looking at recovery of populations. On the edge, uh, a, a, a big focus is on white nose syndrome surveillance. And then in the west, where white nose syndrome PD hasn't been found yet, uh, there's a focus on PD surveillance uh, and population monitoring populations pre white nose syndrome as well as uh, making sure resources are available so that these areas can respond when white nose syndrome gets there. But once white nose syndrome is in a place, there's still little we can do about white nose syndrome itself. And bats are under pressure from many other threats as well uh, that compromise individual uh, and population health. And a lot of these threats can actually be mitigated. So we need to focus uh, not just on white nose syndrome, but on these other threats as well. Uh, on a national level. So the purpose of this webinar is to get a better, a better understanding of uh, the Canadian perspective of bad health. Uh, so less focus on, we're still focusing on disease uh, and we're focusing on health problems, but not just on the problems. We focus on conservation and management and research tools and strategies that uh, have already been shown to inform recovery and conservation actions, aid conservation actions. Um, this, the purpose of this webinar is also to generate interest in a national bat health workshop that would help to further explore the situational context of bat health in Canada, uh, celebrate its program strengths and identify opportunities and weaknesses and those sorts of things. Basically just to, uh, to, to make sure we can improve how we manage bats and change the way we think about managing bats. Now this white nose syndrome or this, <laughs> sorry, this bad health workshop was supposed to take place November this year. That was our plan, but obviously COVID threw a wrench in that. Um, so that's not going to happen yet, uh, but that's that we're working on, on scheduling that whenever we know when we can schedule that. Um, so Again, there's only five minutes per presentation uh, for each speaker. Um, so this webinar is not meant to provide a full review of management and research strategies and outcomes. Uh, see it more as a quick snapshot of the broad topics uh, and, and success stories relating to bad health. See it really as a conversation starter. Um, 
So after all the presenters have spoken, there will be time uh, for questions and discussion. So until then, uh, please keep yourself muted. Uh, there's going to be a lot of information coming your way. So if you have any questions that you think of along the way, uh, write them down for yourself so that you can ask them at the end. Um, so with that, we'll move to our first presenter and I'll pull up uh, the presentation here. Our first presenter is Mike Anisimov with uh, the Canadian Wildlife Service. Mike, go ahead and let me know when you'd like me to uh, change slides. Greetings. Uh, thank you everyone for having me today. And my name is, as you already mentioned, Michael Anisimov, and I'm a wildlife biologist with Environment and Climate Change Canada. And today I'll be pre presenting uh, about bat health management from the federal perspective. Next slide, please, Jordi. So this presentation is meant to provide you with a brief rundown of why ECCC is involved with bats, what ECCC is doing with respect to bats, and that's uh, in terms of high level federal efforts and also ground level ECC project contributions. And then uh, we'll finish with a little bit of ECC's focus for the future. Next slide, please, Jordi. So in Canada, bats are a provincial jurisdiction. So when it comes to ECCC, our focus is more on the federal lands. However, in response to something like, you know, significant population declines uh, in big issues like that, uh, ECC may is issue certain mandates. And a good example of this is the 2014 emergency listing order on the little brown myotis, northern myotis and tricolored bats. And then the resulting 2015 SAR recovery strategy, followed by the 2018 update. Jordi? Thank you. And while we do not have a dedicated bat division at the federal level, ECC groups bats um, under Wildlife Management Directorate alongside migratory birds, birds and polar bears. Polar bears. Uh, uh, while we, while we I'm experiencing a big echo anyway. So while we do the majority of high level work at ECCC and tend to we tend to contract out and contribute to work on the ground. So with respect to the high level efforts for conserving Canada's bats, uh, we work with a number of partners and uh, this year is a good example. So with COVID-19, uh, ECCCC uh, recently assisted the uh, uh, the CWHC to develop interim guidance uh, for wildlife management agencies and recommends uh, handling bats uh, sort of imperative to bat conservation until the, the risks associated with SARS-CoV-2 are better understood. And so as you may be aware, this document identified and promoted a number of precautionary approaches uh, for handling uh, for handling our, our, our bats. Next slide, please, Jordi. So with respect to ground level efforts to conserve Canada's bats, this slide sort of identifies some of the current project work that ECCC is contributing to. And so in particular, ECCC is supporting bat conservation by promoting tracking of white nose syndrome across country, the importance of maintaining um, healthy habitats for bats, and this includes the promotion of hybrid uh, working with universities to collaborate and work on novel research and working with a number of indigenous groups on bat conservation. ECCC is also investigating the impact of, of wind turbines on bats and this is seen in a, a number of recent manuscripts published by ECCC scientists uh, and these manuscripts explore the, the, the possible population declines of our long distance migratory bat species. So moving on please Jordi. Uh, COVID-19 has certainly raised awareness for bad health, and uh, I think that's apparent across uh, the world. Uh, and as for the future in Canada, ECCC will continue promoting work with Canada's provinces and territories in these areas, including bad health. And it is clear that we must uh, increase capacity to cope with the unexpected issues, example COVID-19, and increase our intelligence based on, on vulnerability. And, this also includes working to improve cost sector across sectoral preparedness. And so ECCC is also aware that compared to other taxes, such as birds, um, little is known about the population sizes of bats. So conserving our 
significant habitat is important for conservation and increasing survivability, and this is a priority for ECCCC. So that do, that about does it for my short rendition of, of ECCC and BATS, and I, I thank you for your attention and all my best during these challenging times. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mike. That's perfect timing too. Next up, we're moving on to uh, a bit of a more regional perspective uh, from Tong Jung at uh, the Yukon government. Go ahead, Tong. Great, thank you, Jordi. Uh, can you go to the next slide, please? So I'm gonna talk about bats uh, in the Yukon, uh, just our challenges and opportunities here in the, the uh, slant we've taken to try to conserve bats here. Uh, it may, some of what I say may be applicable to other provinces and territories and some may not be. So just quickly, some of our challenges is we're a big territory with a small human population. We have few biologists. We uh, up until recently had no university, but uh, our university doesn't have a biology department yet. So, so really we don't have that sort of research support within the territory from academics. Uh, much is unknown about basic bat biology at the range edge here in Yukon, Alaska, and WT, for example, and uh, or perhaps the western boreal forest uh, as a whole. And bats tend to be a lower priority, uh, unfortunately, when it comes to funding uh, opportunities in, in our territory. Uh, we do have some opportunities, though, uh, at this time. No known white nose syndrome that buys us perhaps some time. Uh, arguably uh, or debatably, perhaps uh, will be a potential refugia for white nose, time will tell. Uh, but because we have time, we can address other potential stressors and threats, things like landscape change and climate change, and I'll return to those uh, a little bit later. And we can put a focus on stewardship and partnerships. Next. So we've taken the tact uh, really looking at the context that we are at uh, here in, in the Yukon and Northwestern North America and uh, following a really nice paper about five years ago that uh, our next speaker, Craig Willis, was one of the co-authors on. Uh, you can define the context for a, a disease, emergent disease in these four different uh, uh, stages, pre-arrival, invasion front, an epidemic or established. Next. And in Yukon, we're definitely in pre-arrival, uh, as is much of Western Canada. Uh, thank goodness we're not in the invasion front or epidemic at this time, but perhaps we can make some contributions to the established phase. So, so uh, some of the things that we may want to look at in the established phase is making sure that we're dealing with some of the other threats other than the uh, emergent disease. Next slide, please. Uh, so our focus has been, again, on the pre-arrival. Uh, we've looked at things like a risk assessment. We do some targeted monitoring and we're improving communications, which I'll get to in a moment. And in terms of the established, as I said already, we're really looking at trying to provide some information on some of the additional stressors and threats so that once the epidemic moves through, uh, we can focus on recovery of, uh, of remnant populations. Next slide, please. So for improving communication, uh, we've really focused on the public, also property owners, different levels of government, regional bat biologists uh, in, in our region and academic experts. Next slide, please. Next. Next slide, please. It Jordy? looks like we're frozen there. Ah, uh, OK. <laughs> let me quickly reset that. Let's see. Great. Thank you. Uh, this one? Uh, no, it's next one, please. Nope. Still not working. OK, that's that's uh, fine. Yeah. Uh, if we can go up. So anyways, uh, OK, very good. Thank you. So we've produced a number of products. The slide's not showing uh, related to uh, communicating with the public. Sorry, Jordi, can you go up to the, thank you? Perfect. A number of products uh, for the public, uh, brochures, I'm sure most jurisdictions have done this, videos, we've also had uh, panels at bat nurseries. Next one, please. Next slide. As well, uh, we've sort of organized ourselves regionally into a uh, northern bat working group. So biologists that are working on, on bats so we can share information, approaches, uh, share data and perhaps uh, uh, reduce duplication and effort. Next slide, please. And 
we're also working, as I said, uh, moving on to addressing threats. So we're taking a regional focus on the Western Boreal. We're taking a lot of our uh, uh, marching orders from the National Recovery Strategy to, to address uh, identified threats. We have a particular focus on landscape changes that occur at various spatial scales, whether they're regional or local. Uh, we're also securing colonies at risk. And we're looking to fill knowledge gaps that can help us support recovery and stewardship uh, uh, for established populations. Next slide, please. So just some examples. We've had a bit of a regional look at uh, what do we need to know about bats in Northwestern North America. We published that in a special issue, uh, Northwestern Naturalists, about bats in our region. And really it was some of these big landscape changes. Uh, 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 all the work we may do to try to manage for white nose syndrome is for naught if the habitat and landscape is, uh, is not here. So we've tried to look at big things like climate change induced forest fires or insect outbreaks. Next slide, please. As well as local things to look at uh, 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 bat use of rural villages or, or mapping habitat, uh, important habitats in watersheds. Next slide, please. And of course, I always say bats don't read our papers, so we try to do some real on the ground work uh, for bats in terms of saving maternity colonies at risk uh, uh, because uh, of uh, uh, things like roof replacements. Next slide, please. And just in summary, our Yukon approach is to secure colonies and habitats that are at risk, address knowledge gaps about regional threats, uh, we really put a focus on collaborating with experts because we're a very small, small amount of expertise uh, in our territory. And we've really tried to put a focus on combining our data where possible with others in, in other areas, whether it's regionally or nationally or continentally, where possible so we can make better inferences and knowledge gains to better bat conservation. There's a few examples here of papers that have taken more of a national approach that we really try to contribute our data to. Uh, next slide. And just to, just to sum up, uh, really uh, what we're doing in the Yukon is probably different than each other jurisdiction and everyone is different because we're all living in different contexts and we try to scale what we're doing, uh, not scale, but, but direct what we're doing based on the context that uh, we're at. So it, the pre-arrival and the, the established phase is what we're focusing on. Thank you. Thanks, Tom. Sorry for those uh, technical difficulties. Um, That's OK. Uh, uh, I'm trying to manage those. Hopefully it won't happen again. <laughs> All right. Uh, next up, we've got Craig Willis from the University of Winnipeg. Take it away, Craig. Thanks, Jordi. Thanks so much for the invitation and great to see uh, such a good group uh, here today. So Jordi asked me to talk about the academic research perspective on, on bat health. Uh, I obviously can't speak for all the research groups across Canada working on bats. I'm going to talk a little bit about some data uh, from our group, but I think in general we've gone from the kinds of fun things we see on uh, this slide uh, over the last eight months or so to next slide. More of this, and in terms of our group, and I think other academic groups across the country, local acoustic monitoring is probably on an upswing just because field work's been so curtailed and handling of bats has, have been curtailed. And we've also, next one, maybe next two, click it again. We've also gone to some more of uh, this with my nine-year-old daughter at home much of the time from school. She's able to tell me how terrible my posture is at my computer. Uh, we've been doing a lot more writing up uh, and I think that's one of the things that we've been trying to do and maybe a little despair on the side. Um, so uh, I want to talk a little bit about some data that we've been trying to get written up um, over the last uh, last few months that relates to bat population health. Uh, you already next one. Uh, first, though, how does academic research really tackle or contribute to understanding bat health? Well, one of the things I, I think academics help to do alongside managers is to try and quantify population health via capture surveys. Obviously, those have been mostly off the table this summer. And acoustic surveys, those have been more or less on the table, depending where you are and where you work. Next one. Uh, and in the case of my group, we've been uh, trying to test out management actions or management responses 
um, especially to white nose syndrome, uh, which is most of, of what we work on, but obviously academics test uh, responses to other kinds of threats as well. Uh, I sort of divide those into two groups, the spray on bats or spray on substrates kind of treatments, chemical or biological agents. You could spray on an animal or in a hibernaculum. Uh, many groups across North America, including ours, working on testing some of those. Uh, but we're also uh, interested, and my group most recently, most recently has been most interested in uh, understanding how uh, enhancing, protecting, foraging and roosting habitats of bats in summer might help individuals and populations recover from white nose syndrome. And the roosting side of that story is one of the things we've been writing up. Next slide. Uh, and maybe click the next picture. Uh, we're really wondering whether we can enhance summer roosting habitats in a way that help uh, white nose syndrome survivors uh, recover in spring and help their populations grow as the disease passes through into that established phase. Uh, we know that bats love to cuddle in the summer. Maternity colonies cuddle to uh, make it warm so their pups grow quickly. Uh, and that suggests, next slide, that heating up roosts, uh, figuring out what characteristics of roosts make them warm in uh, a natural setting might be something worth testing. And so we've built a whole bunch of these, what we're, we call hot boxes for bats. They're basically an insulated box with a, a thermostat you can see in sort of the, the foreground, a, a standard multi-chamber bat house with a heating coil and a thermostat. We set the temperatures to about 30 degrees and when we put them up all over the place, next slide, um, what we see is that they're warmer and more stable. So the top line there shows uh, a heated box versus outside ambient temperature and uh, an unheated box of basically the same design. And what we see is that our boxes stay close to, but not really overshoot, we think because of that insulation, our set point temperature. And so next slide, we've been asking uh, some questions. First, can warmer roost boxes reduce chronic stress for maternity colonies of bats. And we've been measuring stress based on fecal cortisol uh, in guano collected underneath roosts. Uh, can warmer roosts also, most importantly, improve reproduction to help populations recover? And so if we go to the next one, I'll uh, uh, we've, we've tested this by uh, convincing participants in the Bat Watch Citizen Science Program to let us deploy roosts adjacent to their existing little brown bat colonies. So all of the dots on this map are either a heated or an unheated box colony. Um, and all of these sites were white nose positive by, by 2019. If we look at some data, and I'll show you a few graphs that look uh, like this on the next slide. Um, uh, our heated box on the right, when we collect guano underneath those heated boxes, uh, the cortisol levels in that guano are significantly lower than those from control colonies. That suggests bats in heated boxes have reduced chronic stress. Next slide. Uh, during June, in the prevalency period, the pregnancy period, pregnant females were heavier if they had access to a heated box. And the next slide. That seems also to have translated into a higher reproductive rate. Uh, the ratio of juveniles to adults is three times higher if bats have access to one of our heated boxes. And so if we go to the next slide, um, just to sum up, that suggests to us that there are benefits of warm roosts for bat population health. Um, and uh, we're not really suggesting that everyone go out and plug in bat houses all over the place, but I think it, it highlights that uh, protecting and enhancing high quality habitats for bats in the summer could be really important for helping populations recover from white nose syndrome. And with that, I'll thank you for your attention um, and I'll thank these folks. Thanks, Greg, that was great. Next up, we have uh, Scott McBurney from the Canadian Wildlife Health Cooperative. Go ahead, Scott. Good morning and afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'm here to talk about the importance of health surveillance to Canadian bats. Next slide, please, Jordi. Any wild animal that is found sick or dead for no obvious reason is worth being examined. Um, this is true because uh, wildlife, when they're sick or injured, 
often go into hiding. They want to prevent being predated. They're stressed, that sort of thing. And if they eventually die, they become really important to examine. Uh, small animals like this bat here often get reincorporated in the environment through decomposition and that sort of thing. So they really become a gem, on, on which might make some of you uh, difficult to understand, but for someone like me, it's a gem to get these animals and get an opportunity to examine them. Next slide, please, Jordi. So we all know that bats are facing a number of different threats, and we know some various uh, issues about health in bats. So someone's already talked about climate change. We know about if we start at 12 o'clock and I'm moving in a clockwise direction, we know about white nose syndrome in bats. We know that bats live in buildings and that they carry diseases that are zoonotic to humans like histoplasmosis. Uh, we're concerned for North American bats in terms of SARS-CoV-2, possible transmission to them. We know that bats carry rabies, which can be significant for them and humans. We know wind farm development increasing and that can impact bats. We're at a point in our history where we're probably doing more handling and research on bats than ever before. That can have impacts on these populations. And it's really important if one of your research subjects dies that uh, we do take an opportunity to take a look at it because those bats have a known history which can really help us out a fair about as well. And then we also know that bats are exposed to various toxicants and that sort of thing. I've got neonicotinoid insecticides there as an example. And we have to collect the evidence over time to figure out what exactly is happening. Next slide, please, Jordi. And what this particular individual might tell us about threats that are coming that haven't arrived yet and can provide evidence to support some of the other threats that we assume might be impacting bats. Next slide, please, Jordi. So what we do with that dead bat when it comes into our hands is we subjected to a barrage of various different tests, starting at the top. We do a gross necropsy on it. The next picture down is a slide of a histology section looking at the tissues under the microscope, and that's white nose syndrome on the wing of a bat. Then the next slide down, we use various molecular techniques like PCR to look for various infectious organisms and that sort of thing. And then the next picture down at the bottom shows that we also use other traditional things like virology and toxicology and bacteriology to really try to figure out what may have related to that bat's death and caused its death. What's really important down at the bottom as well is that uh, someone is typing information to a computer. Everything that we get here goes into a database so an individual mortality incident may be a one-off, but as we collect data across the country and accumulate data over time, it becomes really important because it gives us a greater understanding as to what is impacting bats. And then what we have to do really is translate and mobilize that surveillance and research evidence into practice. And to do this, we really have to have well-defined case definitions we want to work with labs that are standardized or harmonized so we know the information that we're getting is the same. We want good quality control and quality assurance. And we want laboratory networks that collaborate with wildlife health professionals representing a wide variety of disciplines because we can also collect tissues at the time that we're doing our work to help out with other research initiatives. Next slide, please, Jordi. And what we're ultimately trying to do with that information, if we work from the top left, we want to predict, and there's the white nose surveillance map as an example. We want to prevent, and we want to use information like to prevent bats from their exposure to COVID-19, uh, that publication that we put out earlier this year. We want to use, there's on the bottom left, there's the decontamination procedure for bats. So we want to help prevent any disease getting into bat populations. And then we want to manage. So of course, bats and buildings information there. And then on the bottom right, uh, the National Response Plan for White Nose in Canada. Next slide, please, Jordi. So really what I'm trying to do uh, when I take an, a look at that individual animal is I want to use it as a window on the population. And I want to be able to use that individual to project into the population what might be happening and impacting that population so that we can predict and prevent and manage going forward. Next slide, Jordi. And use that information to the benefit of the population to make sure that 
healthy populations of bats remain on the landscape. Next slide, please, Jordi. So I read uh, an article before producing this presentation today, and they said that you're always supposed to leave your with these short presentation, your audience with one sentence that uh, they should be able to remember from your talk. And so I thought I'm talking about scanning surveillance. And the one sentence that I want you all to be aware of is the wise words of Monty Python and the Holy Grail, which is bring out your dead. We are always looking as wildlife pathologists for you to submit animals to us for examination. We cannot be everywhere all the time. Various researchers, wildlife managers in the jobs that you do, you're on the field. You're the ones that see these mortality incidents and these individual dead animals, and we rely on you to submit them to us for examination. Next slide, Jordi. So with that, I'll leave it and I thank you for your attention and I'll address any questions later on uh, this afternoon and this morning. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Scott. Moving on, we've got uh, Brock Fenton with Western University. Take it away, Brock. And don't forget to unmute yourself. Let's see, you're still muted, Brock. Yeah. Thank you for asking me. <laughs> there we go. It's really important for us as bat biologists to recognize that bats are associated with rabies and that can spill over to people. And fortunately for us, at least in Canada, this happens relatively ra rarely. Nine human deaths from rabies in Canada from 1970 to 2019. Seven of these cases the rabies was caused by bat rabies variants, three from silver-haired bats and tricolored bats, one from a myotis, and the other two cases were associated with dogs. The missing data for what variants were associated with bats are just not available, and probably because it was before that kind of thing was detected. Next slide, please. Rabies is often spread by bites. Saliva with in infected with virus gets into the wound, Aerosol transmission of rabies appears to be a folklore thing rather than reality. Once a patient human shows clinical symptoms of rabies, it is virtually always fatal. Pre-exposure shots can provide good protection against rabies, but be sure to have your titer checked regularly, additional shots as required. In Canada, post-exposure prophylaxis, PPE, is covered by health care, Pre-exposure usually is not. Next slide, please. In Canada, rabies from two species of bats, Lysinicterus and Perimyotis, account for most human deaths from rabies when we have data. The adult, typical adult weight of these bats is 9 and 10 grams respectively. Neither species is commonly found in buildings, and that presents an interesting puzzle to us. The next slide a big brown bat, a bat that's very commonly found in buildings and as far as I've been able to find so far, in Canada at least, there are no records of human deaths from the Aptesicus variant of rabies. So try to figure that one out. It's an interesting problem. The real question here is the batter of size. So the next slide shows us how very easy it can be to overlook the bite of a bat. On the top here is an Aptescus, the skull of a bat sitting on my finger, and then a Lasionicterus, which is slightly smaller. And all of these compared to vampire bats, which are not a big issue in, in Canada. But remember, there are records of bat variants of rabies being found in foxes, for example. And when you go to South America, in the case of rabies, uh, vampire rabies found in house cats, very interesting possible spillover there, but we don't know very much about it. The next slide. These are three papers that are worth looking at. The first one is about the man that died of rabies in British Columbia back in June of 2019. And that's from a scratch apparently. And whether it's a scratch or a bite, it's so easy to overlook the bite. The reason reading that paper is important is it gives you an idea of how complicated the situation could be. So in closing, we can't deny that bats are associated with rabies. We can't brush it off and say, oh, well, it hardly ever happens. 
because that doesn't help. When you then read a case study like the Daniels et al. one, and there are others, you realize the human deathstroke rabies are pretty ghastly, and I can only presume that bat rabies, bat deathstroke bat rabies are even worse. Thank you. So I don't think bats carry rabies, but rabies surely kills them, and that suggests they're not asymptomatic carriers. Thank you. Thank you very much, Brooke. Moving on to the next presenter is Megan Jones with the Canadian Wildlife Health Cooperative in the Atlantic region. Hi, everybody, and thanks so much for inviting me to talk about this. So um, I am a pathologist to uh, I'm a veterinary pathologist here in Atlantic Canada, and I'm I'll preface this by saying I'm not personally doing research on bats and COVID-19, but I am part of a federal, provincial, territorial COVID-19 One Health working group, along with some people on this call. Um, and so I have been thinking about this topic a fair bit recently. So next slide, please, Jordi. So um, we're looking at COVID-19 as a threat to Canadian bat species. So we know that it's obviously a threat to humans, but what could it do to bats? Um, so there's some fundamental questions that we actually don't really know full answers to at this point. So are Canadian bats susceptible to SARS-CoV-2, the virus that causes COVID-19? If infected, do they get sick or do they die? Um, how can we assess these risks and how can we minimize these risks? Next slide, please, Jordi. So this is a very wordy slide for which I apologize, but with only five minutes, I wanted to pack in the information. Um, so what do we know, stepping back from bats, what do we know about animals and SARS-CoV-2? Um, so this virus is, of course, um, the, the virus that causes COVID-19. It's a member of the coronavirus family. Um, and I'm pointing out it's a beta coronavirus. That will be relevant in a minute. Um, the virus is thought to have an animal source, as we all know, but we, has, we also know that we have not yet confirmed that. Um, and I wanted to point out, written in red here, the COVID-19 pandemic is driven by human this is a human disease, and we believe that animals play a negligible role in the maintenance of this pandemic. However, we're going to think about it from the point of view of what can happen to animals that are infected with this. Um, there have been several animals that have been seen to be naturally infected through close contact with humans, um, domestic dogs and cats in multiple countries in the world. And we recently just had our first confirmed case in Canada of a domestic dog that was infected from a, in a family in Ontario. Um, and then as we well, we know exotic felids, uh, lions and tigers at the Bronx Zoo were infected um, from humans and cats, dose, they get some uh, respiratory signs, um, dogs less so. And then farmed mink are a very interesting case. There have been outbreaks in mink farms in multiple countries and now in the United States as well. The mink do have clinical disease. They transmit the virus mink to mink and they probably have transmitted it back to humans. That's what's suspected. And when you look at the lungs of these mink that die from COVID-19, they actually have lesions very similar to what's been described in humans. So mink uh, and probably other mustelids are probably at a high risk for this disease. So that's something we're thinking about. Um, and then there's been also some experimental infections that I'm showing you here on the right. Um, the ones with an asterisk are ones that um, species that have been infected and show some clinical signs. You'll notice they're the only published case of experimental infection in bats has been Egyptian fruit bats, which were experimentally infected intranasally. They did not get sick, but they did shed the virus and spread it bat to bat. Uh, next slide, please. So what do we know about bats and coronaviruses? Um, well, we know that bats do carry some of the pathogenic human coronaviruses. A very close relative of the COVID-19 virus has been found in horseshoe bats and some of the other nasty bats as well, like uh, nasty viruses as well, like SARS. What about North America? Well, a variety of coronaviruses have been detected in North American bats. Um, the beta coronaviruses, which is where the COVID-19 falls, um, that, that group has only been detected in bats in Mexico in North America. But alpha coronaviruses have been found in bats in Canada. These are not known to be pathogenic. Next slide, please. Um, another interesting fact, of course, with uh, thinking about bat susceptibility to COVID-19 in North America is white nose syndrome. We know that this disease can be associated with immunosuppression. Christina Davies' group in um, 2018 published a, a really interesting paper showing that bats that were already naturally infected with a coronavirus, it was a benign coronavirus they happened to be carrying, 
that were then co-infected with PD, white nose syndrome, um, they actually showed increased replication rates of the virus in their intestine, and it seemed like they might have some differences in their antiviral responses. Next slide, please. So are Canadian bats susceptible? Maybe. Um, we have found other coronaviruses, and that raises the possibility. If infected, are they likely to experience clinical disease? We don't know the answer to that, but we know that there's a possible interaction with white nose syndrome, which is really important to consider. Next slide, please. And so how can we assess these risks? There are risk assessments that are ongoing. USGS published one that's shown here. And as well, we need we still need more data from observation and experimental studies. And, and then the last slide, please, Jordi. So the real take home point to this is, as um, Mike mentioned at the beginning, uh, several members of our group work with Environment Canada to show these recommendations, to develop these recommendations for wildlife agencies. And we recommend a precautionary approach. So avoid handling bats unless necessary, postpone research that isn't imperative for conservation. And if you do have to interact with bats, then you have to wear appropriate PPE. Um, and of course, this is uh, these guidelines are similar to what the OIE has put out. And I have some links to these guidelines at the end of the document. So the last slide just has some information for you um, in case you're looking for it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Megan. And any of those links can uh, always be requested at a later time too. Next up, we have uh, Aaron Berwald with uh, the University of Northern British Columbia. Take it away, Aaron. Uh, thanks, Jordan. Next slide, please. So wind energy is, is growing very rapidly around the world, um, particularly, well, maybe if uh, the election south goes the way we hope it does, um, there's going to be even more increases in wind energy around the world. Next slide, please. Which is really quite good for reducing our CO2 emissions. We can see wind there way at the left side. This is um, emissions of equivalent of carbon dioxide per kilowatt hour. And we see wind is very, very low. So it's very good in reducing our um, global carbon emissions. So we want more of it in the ground. Next slide, please. But as with any wind energy source or any electricity source, it does have a cost. Um, a few years ago, we estimated the, the cumulative impact of uh, wind energy on bat populations in North America. We estimated between 840,000 and 1.7 million bats had been killed in the first 10 years of the wind energy boom. Next slide, please. Uh, but of course, those numbers continue to increase every year as wind energy keeps going into the ground and keeps operating. Can you click it, please? Um, across the US, the average number of bats killed per megawatt is about 2.66 bats per megawatt per year. Next slide. Next click. Um, I just looked it up yesterday. There's now about 110,000 megawatts installed in the US. So that's about 290,000 bats every year just in the US alone. When we look at Canada, uh, it's about 11.4 bats per turbine per year. So slightly different metric, but next, please. We can look that out. We have about 13,000 megawatts installed in Canada, and each one averages about two megawatts. Um, they're getting a little bit bigger, but this is good average. So we think there's about 76,000 bats killed every year just in Canada. So about 400,000 bats killed every year in the US and Canada. Next, please. Of all those fatalities across uh, North America, about 19% of those are of silverhaired bats. Next, please. About 23% of all bat fatalities in North America are of eastern red bats. Next. And 32% are of hoary bats. Next. When we think of uh, cumulative impacts and cumulative effects, um, we can break it down and look at some of the species that are most affected by white nose. Tricolored bats across US and Canada tend to make up about 5% of fatalities. Little brown myotis, about 7%, and northern long-eared make up very, very few of the fatalities of less than 0.1% of fatalities at turbines. Next, please. Uh, but of course, fatality rates are highly variable. They're variable across the entire country and across the continent, and even within sites, they can be quite variable. Variable at the rate, so how many bats are killed per turbine per year, and also which species are killed in which sites. Next, please. So this is a graph from uh, American data from the American Wind Wildlife um, Information Center. We have estimated bat fatalities per megawatt in the Y, and kind of the 
uh, Fish and Wildlife Service region on the um, x-axis here. And we can see a lot of variability in these regions, where if we look at the Midwest on the far left here, you see a higher average um, fatality rate per turbine than we would do in the Pacific, for example, or in this mountain, that mountain prairie sort of region. So they are very variable across the country. And in some cases, like in Texas or in the South, we have um, a switch in proportions. We have many more Mexican free tail bats being killed than many of the other species. Next, please. We're really concerned about these, um, even though we may not know the overall significance, we're concerned because of a few main patterns. Next. We know that most of these species have little or no protection. If they do, it's kind of a hodgepodge. Um, they're, as we heard earlier, they're protected at the provincial level, not at overall at the federal level. And this goes for both countries. We know that fatalities come from these really large catchment areas. So fatalities at one single site could represent bats who have migrated thousands of kilometers from these very, from quite large areas. Turbines tend to kill prime breeding age adults. They're not killing just young dumb juveniles uh, that may or may not reproduce that year. We know that bats have slow life histories, um, produce very few offspring, and we think that bat populations may already be in decline, and so this may be an additive mortality that they may or may not be able to handle. Next. So if we think about their population's decline, more and more work is coming out recently looking at some of the big species. Recent, a uh, couple of years old, frick it all. Um, estimated that given current fatality rates, not expanding fatality rates with wind energy, um, the most likely estimate was a 90% decline within 50 years of the hoary bat population. Next. Um, and so when we actually look at that, we dig into that a little bit more, we estimate that they may be declining this much, but what do we actually see on the ground? A couple of papers recently, so Davey et al. just published a great paper that came out this summer, and um, work that Robert Barkley and I have been doing, have been looking at changing fatality rates over time at turbines, and we see mostly significant declines for hoaries, reds, and, and silver haired. So over time, fewer and fewer bats are being killed, which may or may not be a good thing. There may be fewer available to be killed. When we look at capture and acoustic detection rates from a suite of studies, um, various long-term studies from across Canada and the US, we see a bit of mixed results, but mostly declining numbers of captures and acoustic detections of these three species. Uh, Rodhouse et al. Uh, last year published a paper in the Pacific Northwest using some acoustic data, long-term acoustic data, and they saw about a 2% decline per year in occupancy of hoary bats in the Pacific Northwest, so leading to think that there's just fewer of them around. Next. And when we looked at rabies submission rates kind of from a time period from the CDC, from time period of pre-wind um, energy boom to post-wind energy boom, we saw all declines. So there's fewer and fewer of these bats being turned in, of the hoaries, reds, and silvers being turned in for rabies testing, which can be a good metric for how many are there on the ground. There seems to be fewer. So all of these metrics we looked at seem to uh, suggest that populations are declining. Next. But there are some good news. We can still put wind in the ground in responsible ways. Lots of positive work being done with operational curtailment. Um, so turning turbines off um, in low wind speeds can reduce fatalities by about 60%. Lots of really good work with acoustic deterrence. Um, some really promising work that can reduce fatalities, not across the board, not at every site and every species, but can reduce fatalities again by about 50%. Um, still in the early stages, but we can do informed sightings so build them in better spots. Next. Uh, we can be starting to look at habitat compensation. So Craig said, can you have better habitat to improve uh, resiliency? Well, maybe we could be doing something like this for turbines. Um, next, we are look, starting to look more and more about why bats are attracted to turbines and can we make them less attractive, looking at behavior and uh, hypothesis. Next. And we really have to start thinking about man managing cumulative effects. It's not just wind energy, so uh, what uh, PD has been found on silver herd bats, for example, so maybe they will end up with white nose and may impact them there. So we may have to start thinking about managing the threats of white nose and wind energy together. And that's next, please. If you have any questions, you can email me there or take them later. Thank you. Thanks very much, Aaron. That was great. Next up, we have uh, Jason Ray uh, with uh, Wildlife Conservation Society Canada. Thank you, Yuri. Um, so my name is Jason Ray. Um, I'm working at Wildlife Conservation Society Canada, helping to implement the North American Bat Monitoring Program in British Columbia. I'm working with uh, Corey Lawson, who is um, 
also part of the Wildlife Conservation Society of Canada. Um, and that image back there was just one of our acoustic detectors. Thanks, Erdy. Um, so this here is a the heart of our NMET monitoring. These are 10 by 10 kilometer grid cells, which we monitor with two to four stationary acoustic detectors, those yellow dots, deployed for seven nights. Um, each cell leader also conducts two replicates of a 30 to 45 kilometer driving transect during that same week. You may note that this week-long deployment duration is above the Continental Program guidelines, uh, particularly because we're looking at our trends on a slightly finer scale. Next slide, please. We're producing some information on bat species distribution and relative activity across the province. Of course, the data we collect can be used for many other applications, and we're working to support those goals too. To date, we have confirmed the presence of all species in BC and two, and two others that are either likely existing in smaller numbers, numbers or accidental. Species are being detected well throughout their current known distributions, as well as occasional extra limital observations that I'll talk about in a couple of slides. I should note that within this set of resident species, there are a few very difficult to conclusively label as present through acoustic alone. So in areas where we didn't expect those species, we are following up with uh, netting and other things like that. Next slide, please. Now, our NABAT effort represents a collaboration of over 50 biologists, volunteers from 21, from 21 organizations gathering and analyzing data in addition to field assistants, techs, WCSC staff, and so on. We started with 22 grid cells in 2016 and have since expanded to 54 grid cells operating across BC in 2020. Each year we ship about 17 equipments of bins of equipment around the province and gather well over 1,250 detector nights of recordings, within which we pick out over 250,000 15 second bat files. And we follow up on these using manual ID to pull out species ID. Um, I'm also happy to note that nearly all of our grid cells established in 2016 are still running. Our grid leaders have been amazingly keen, dedicated and supportive. Oftentimes they're unable to, if they're unable to continue working with us, they have already identified or helped line up the next person who to take over that grid cell in their absence. With that, I'd like to kind of thank the funders, volunteers and partners on this slide here. This is not an exhaustive list, but their efforts are instrumental to our establishment of the program in BC. Next slide, please. Now, we're currently finishing our fifth year of monitoring in BC, and over the years we have notably expanded and filled in some species ranges in BC, complementing existing acoustic and capture data already. Uh, this last year, we found spotted bats a little bit further west outside their known range than we expected, the Skagit Valley area. This kind of corresponds to the northern tip of a species distribution in the US, so it's neat to see that coming up to Canada. We also have fringe bat identified in southeastern BC, uh, Kimberley area. This is a little bit further east than their last records. Um, that said, the habitat type, habitat type is in this area, so their presence was not wholly unexpected. We've also expanded northern Myotis range a little bit further south, the southern tip of their, their range in Meadow Creek area expanded a little bit, as well as Yuma Myotis near north central, central BC and Smithers area. We are also providing a little bit more evidence to support the presence of Mexican free-tailed in, in southwestern coastal, B, coastal BC. This is adding into Peter O'Munson's paper in 2017. And otherwise, we're collecting small records of uh, eastern red bat recordings that are in scattered scattered grid cells outside the northeastern BC region where you we've collected, not we personally, but where the um, carcasses of red bats have been collected from areas in northeastern where we're seeing red bat popping up in scattered cells throughout the rest of BC. Um, frequently the same cells but never appearing in large numbers. Next slide please, Jordi. Our next steps from here are to of course continue monitoring. Uh, but also now that we have a full five years of data from the grid cells, we're working towards more applications as well. Starting with these cells, we're beginning a five-year analysis to formally examine the trends in relative activity and abundance across the province. Particularly with white-nose syndrome spreading through Washington each year, this after it's jumped to the west, these data will be very useful to examine and respond to differential mortality between species when it arrives here. We are contributing our data to update the BC CDC range maps, as you'd expect with the previous expansions we talked about in the last slide. And additional questions we're looking at are evaluating the use of stationary detectors to replace or supplement the transects within certain cells, if those data can be used to make the same inferences. We are running cost-benefit analyses of each cell to determine if the data are useful enough to continue monitoring all of our cells, or if we can drop some to save some money. 
We're testing to ensure whether we have sufficient sample sizes within regions to detect local trends. We are looking to compare auto ID labels to our manual IDs to test whether auto ID can produce any reliable results in if a recording was classified with high ratio of matching pulses or something along those lines to save a little bit of money on our analysis. And last, we're looking to use our existing data to highlight any species that may have too low of detectability to, to adequately survey using our current methodology. And next slide, Jordi. Uh, with that, just one last thank you to our funders, um, and I can pass on to our next presenter. Thanks very much, Jason. That was great. Thank you. Next up, we have Tessa McBurney from uh, the, Wild, the Canadian Wildlife Health Cooperative Atlantic Region. Take it away, Tessa. Thanks, Jordi. Uh, yeah, so I'm Tessa McBurney, and I'm from the Canadian Wildlife Health Cooperative Atlantic Region. And today I'm going to talk about protecting bat health through management of bats in buildings. Next slide, please. So most of our work with bats in buildings has been related to our Atlantic Bat Conservation Project. Uh, so we've had two multi-year HSP projects with funding through Environment and Climate Change Canada and also support from our provincial partners in all four Atlantic provinces. And uh, the goal of this project is to protect three uh, bat species at risk, the little brown myotis, the northern myotis, and the tricolored bat, all listed as endangered. Next slide, please. So how bat health relates to bats and buildings? So within our project, there have been three main areas where management of bats and buildings has directly impacted bat health. The first is mitigation of sources of mortality. The second is disease surveillance. And the third is population recovery assessment. Next slide, please. So for mitigation of sources of mortality, this is primarily to prevent bats from being intentionally or accidentally improperly evicted from anthropogenic structures. So common examples include sealing bats within buildings. Unfortunately, sometimes bats are still smoked out of buildings and homeowners using other lethal bat removal methods. It's also important to consider the seasonal timing and life cycles of bats when conducting exclusions. So this is to prevent pup mortality in the summers, so not removing the mothers before the pups become volant, and also adult mortality in the winters. We do have one bat species in Atlantic Canada that does hibernate in buildings in the winter. Uh, we also manage other risks bats encounter when residing with humans. So this includes sticky traps. So you can see a bat submitted to us in the top right there, um, as well as outdoor cat predation, which you can see in the bottom right image uh, that bat has evidence of trauma likely due to cat predation. So we've accomplished this through development of best management practices for managing bats and buildings, which are specific to each Atlantic province. Also workshops to train nuisance wildlife control operators and pest control, control operators, in addition to our Atlantic bat hotline. Next slide, please. Uh, so these maps just show um, the exclusion calls we've received to our Atlantic bat hotline where callers have self-reported the exclusion outcome. So we've had 33 out of 38 successful exclusion calls, which we consider successful if mortality or injury has been mitigated once we've been contacted, and five out of 38 unsuccessful exclusion calls, which are cases where people seemed unwilling to wait for the appropriate time of year to remove bats from buildings. Next slide, please. Uh, so for disease surveillance, this has been accomplished through our pest control operator training in the Atlantic Bat Hotline. Uh, so you can see we've received a fair number of bats from Newfoundland and Labrador, Prince Edward Island and New Brunswick, either submitted to the CWHC for necropsy or directly to the CFIA for rabies testing in cases of human or domestic animal potential contact. Uh, so fortunately, zero bats have been diagnosed as rabies positive, although you can see we do still have some pending cases. Um, and seven bats have been diagnosed as white nose syndrome positive, which has allowed us to confirm the spread of white nose syndrome in Newfoundland and has also confirmed that white nose syndrome is still affecting bats in provinces where the disease has been present for many years, such as Prince Edward Island. Next slide, please. Uh, so for population recovery assessment, this has been accomplished again through the Atlantic Bat Hotline and Pest Control Operator Training, and this is primarily related to colony counts, which are an important tool for assessing bat population recovery. Hibernacula, hibernacula counts can be challenging for several reasons. Often it's unsafe or impossible to access these sites if we can even locate them. Um, there is always a risk of spreading PD, and the surveys can be disruptive to hibernating bats and can affect their critical energy reserves. Colony counts, so here we're talking about external roost surveys, don't really have any direct impact on roosting bats and can provide estimates on population size. 
So this is important for both populations recovering from white nose syndrome, so all of the maritime provinces, and for documenting population size prior to anticipated white nose syndrome declines, so in Newfoundland and potentially Labrador. And you can see that we have counted a, a fairly decent number of bats in these provinces. Next slide, please. Um, so obviously I'll be taking questions later on if anyone has any questions. Next slide, please. And that's all. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tessa. That was great. Next up, we've got uh, Mandy Kellner um, with the Community Bet Program of BC. Take it away, Mandy. Hi, Jordi. Yeah, the slides actually have timing. If you can just press play, I wonder if that would work. Oh. Um, or is that too crazy? We don't have um, to do that. Yeah, <laughs> I, I don't see my menu right now. Oh, wait. Uh, let's see. Slideshow. From beginning? Just from beginning. OK, here we go. Maybe that'll work. Um, hi, yeah, I'm speaking you, to, you, to you guys today from my role as the provincial coordinator of the BC Community Bat Program, um, talking about bat-friendly communities in BC. Let's see if it changes. I can override it manually too. <laughs> Might need to, doesn't look like it's doing anything. So uh, why are we talking about this initiative here? Well, it's a tool to broaden our approach to improving bat health in BC. And I don't need to tell you guys that uh, bats are threatened by many factors. We have 15 species in BC and about seven are known to be affected by white nose syndrome at the moment, uh, plus the three migratory tree bats that Aaron was just talking about. Next slide. This is a quick update of white nose in BC for those of you in the east. So it's not confirmed yet in the province, but PD has been detected since and white nose since 2016 in Washington and of course are continuing to spread. And the map on the right is a close up of the most recent detections, about 100 to 120 kilometers from Vancouver Island, Vancouver and the Okanagan. Oh, there we go. So what are we doing? We can't at the moment take any widespread action other than building and supporting healthy bat populations, although we're all waiting and anticipating the, the development of probiotic and vaccines. So we're doing a number of things, citizen science monitoring. What can we be doing better? <laughs> Maybe the timings aren't working. That was just skipping ahead. Okay, uh, that's my attempt at a Venn diagram of what we could be doing better when I stop to think about it. Um, highlighting that with the community bat program, there's one group or sector that we don't communicate much about bats, and that's at the regional municipal level. Um, and that's where we can really be doing some actions on the ground right now, I think, encouraging local stewardship and working at um, planning at a local level. And that's what brings us to the bat friendly community approach. And it's meant to incorporate multiple actions, conservation actions implemented by local people that easily overlap with other things they're already doing. They're widely achievable, so it's not hard to be a bat-friendly community. Um, and of course, bat-friendly actions can be done by anyone, but we also have our certification program for municipalities to encourage them to get on board and learn about bats. And for that, we have this, uh, we've outlined the three components. I'll talk about each one here. So the first one is to protect, enhance, or create bat habitat. The habitat base is going to ensure that bats have habitat for food, shelter, and water, um, build resilient populations, and hopefully support survivors after white nose. And that's where we think the program is going to have a lot of overlap with what many local governments are already working on, including protection of wetlands and riparian areas. The second component is that we ask people to provide information about bats, and specifically our best management practices for bats and human structures. And that's going to help protect both bats and humans. And so a bat-friendly community is going to make these uh, BMPs available to homeowners and to industry and help us spread information that way. And the final component is that we ask people to promote learning. And that's mostly because the myths and misinformation about bats are what are leading to unnecessary persecution uh, by humans when you have bats in your private land. And so we're trying to counter this by sharing correct factual information and resources. And we choose two days to sort of highlight and get people to stress. Quick examples about our bat-friendly communities right now. We have uh, three, four in the province. Um, one, the, one is about to do a press release. One of them is Peachland. They have a very large Yuma colony and they focus a lot on um, protection of that colony, of course, and outreach and education. Also working on bat-friendly lighting. Richmond became bat friendly in uh, January 2020, and they have a bit of a different focus, a little more habitat based, um, protecting green spaces, um, starting to do a bit more outreach and education. 
and they just co-hosted our Bat Matters 2020 conference, which was focused on bat-friendly community development. Uh, we do have other communities working on becoming bat-friendly. And what I think is quite interesting is just that uh, very different approaches in the different towns. And to wrap up, I just wanted to talk about a few of the lessons that we've learned so far. There we go, thank you. Um, so thinking about how it's gone in the couple of years we've been working on getting this program going. Uh, the main thing I think is keep it simple to get buy-in. You do need to encourage overlap with existing programs because people get burned out on different initiatives. You need to encourage diversity and learning from each other. Um, I, I really enjoy how different our four communities are. And finally, don't force it. You can't, uh, thank you. You can't force st good stewardship. You really need it to be from the ground up. Um, we can provide tools and support. But uh, yeah, and hold hands a bit, but it really does need to come from people on the ground. So thanks in closing, I just wanted to mention that uh, we have many supporters for the Community BAT program, many regional supporters. And if you want more information about our program, you can check out our website or email. Thanks. Thanks very much, Mandy. That uh, hybrid approach between auto next and manual next <laughs> All right, then we have our final speaker, which is Leanne Isaac with the Kootenai uh, Community BET program. Take it away, Leanne. Thanks very much, Jordi. Uh, I'm speaking today as my role as the project coordinator in the Kootenai Community BET project for the last three years. And next slide, please. Just to give you a visual of where we work and, and how we do our work. So we occur in, or our program covers the Kootenai region. So the red shaded polygon in the Southeast corner of uh, BC. It started in 2004 and it was the, uh, the work of Juliet Craig and Mike Serrell that instigated this work in the Slocan Valley. And since then um, it has grown not only from our small regional program uh, to the broader BC community program. So we're very proud of that and our contributions to that. This is how we do our work, all of the funders that are listed on the, on the side. And if I could just point out, the Columbia Basin Trust has funded our program in various ways for the past 16 years. So I just want to uh, point that out. We've got two coordinators uh, in the East and West Kootenai and 12 community leads that are sort of distributed throughout the region. Next slide, please. We are uh, focused on the conservation of bats in the Kootenai region, and we focus on three main objectives, and that's uh, the support of landowners that have bats or who want bats by providing in-person and print resources. Uh, the second objective, to increase the overall education around bats by facilitating awareness and outreach. And finally, to gather baseline population data and distribution data uh, by engaging with citizen scientists. Next slide, please. We have a variety of approaches that inform how we communicate with uh, residents in the Kootenai region. And the first uh, approach is alignment with what we have determined at a provincial level to be important. And we had a focal working group to brainstorm and identify and prioritize key messages at our most recent British Columbia Bad Action Team conference uh, last fall. And so we ensure that we reinforce those provincial messages in our region. We, the regional uh, contacts that I mentioned that we do have, we refer to them as our BAT ambassadors. And we take a train the trainer approach to ensure that we've got um, accurate, uh, consistent messaging that's being conveyed throughout the region. And our goal is to complete training uh, every three years in order to bring people up to speed on the most recent messaging. And the final thing I just want to touch on is the incorporation of community-based social marketing, which it, you might be familiar with this. It's a process to create sustainable long-term behavior change, and that can be anything from energy conservation um, to, in our case, bat conservation. Uh, next slide, please. So community-based social marketing, it's well known in the social science field. Uh, here is a text on the left-hand side by one of the 
the leading thinkers, Doug Mackenzie Moore. And three years ago, we had an expert team of eight individuals participate in an intensive three-day training session that was led by Doug. And the um, essential process involved in community-based social marketing is shown on the right. And so you move through a series of steps, beginning uh, with selecting behavior on the top right-hand section of that uh, cycle. And then you work through the process and you end up at what is referred to as the end state, the result, the action that you want to get. So with selecting behaviors, you are brainstorming a list of all the behaviors that you uh, are interested in to get you to that end state. And these behaviors are referred to as non-divisible end state behaviors. So these are specific um, behaviors and actions that you want people to take. You then move through a process of evaluating them. Uh, so you... Uh, essentially uh, rank the impact of each um, of those behaviors. And you can use empirical data or expert in, uh, input. Then you move to, um, once you have fine-tuned that behavior list, you then move to understand the barriers and the benefits associated with each of those, be uh, of those behaviors. This can involve observation work, uh, previous work, um, surveys, and what you're doing in behaviors and benefits is identifying uh, how likely it is that those, those behaviors that you've identified will be adopted and how prevalent are those behaviors already. And once you understand the barriers and benefits, then you then design your strategy accordingly. And your strategy can include a variety of tools from prompts uh, to creating norms to ultimately leading to some type of diffusion, a social diffusion that your message can be communicated throughout uh, your region of interest. Uh, next slide, please. We learned a lot in this process uh, and it's, it was very clear that uh, to us that you need to be very, uh, very focused on what you want that end state to be uh, we worked through a variety of behaviors and we, we concluded we just need to do a lot of additional homework to even get to that strategy development, which what, uh, is something that we've got planned for 2021. Um, and so I'll uh, definitely keep you informed on what those strategies um, look like. Uh, next slide, please. So this is just a highlight of some of the things that we learned in terms of the process. Checking the research. Um, just so that we could really focus our work and our messaging. What are the needs of the target audience? Who, who is it exactly that we want to reach out to? Is it homeowners? Is it roofers? Is it pest control? Uh, who's doing the behavior? So making that target very clear. Um, being very uh, clear in terms of what are the real barriers and what are perceived barriers. And then when you go through and develop the strategy, once you've identified your behavior, there's a variety of important components to consider, emphasizing the, be the benefit of that behavior that you want to see, using prompts that are uh, obvious to people, making declarations, highlighting success stories. And the most important part is checking back once you have that strategy in place uh, checking back to see what worked and what didn't work uh, to then tweak it and then implement your program. Next slide, please. And so what we learned is we needed to uh, gather uh, all of our information that we had learned in the previous 16 years to really fine tune the behaviors. And this was a result. Uh, we uh, came up with a synthesis of all that work. We worked with a, a database designer. Next, uh, next slide to develop a linked beta database that can highlight our contacts, our site visits, colony information, DNA testing, count data, uh, dead bat submission. So everything is linked and so we can query things uh, accordingly. Next slide. And this is, as a result of that, this is what we summarized and presented at the last NASPER conference. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this is uh, because of our outreach um, 
uh, we were unable to do that this year because of COVID. And so we've taken a passive approach to try to connect with people. And this is a new uh, banner that we've used. And the bottom uh, section, the you can help section, or is targeting the four uh, actions that we want people to uh, think about and to become involved with. And the next two slides or two clicks. And we post it in the various communities in our region as a sort of a passive way to engage with people and to prompt them to take action by participating in our bat counts, by uh, submitting dead bats, for um, installing bat boxes when there are exclusions, and for um, helping us and uh, dispel myths about bats. And next slide. So if you have any questions or are interested about taking this approach to creating that long-term sustainable behavior change, I really encourage you to check out that website and Doug's uh, book that's uh, listed there. And that's it for me. Thank you. Thank you very much, Leanne. Let's see here. That was great. Thank you, everyone. Um, Thanks to all of our speakers. So it's it's really, let's see, whatever. Okay, yeah. Um, it's really good to hear about the, this variety of topics, and and it really demonstrates how broad and diverse uh, the the topic of bad health really is, and and that it requires a broad range of of practitioners that that look at bad health through these different lenses. So we've heard about the federal mandate, regional governmental context, um, academic research context. Um, the disease uh, threats uh, relating to, to wind turbines and other threats, um, and then also how important it is to, to uh, do community engagement uh, and, and work with outreach experts. I mean, community-based social marketing to, to, to draw something in from social sciences to really reach your public, reach your audience. Um, we're all working on, on different things, but all working towards the same goal. And, and I think this uh, all of these, these quick talks really demonstrated that very well. It also demonstrated that bad health is uh, subject to a cumulative effect. Obviously, there's there's a multitude of issues that negatively affect our bad populations. But another cumulative effect is the actions that we can take uh, that positively affect bats and all of these good news stories that we've heard here. Um, uh, that, that the thing, things we do to, to mitigate the threats to bats and to get the community involved. Um, so knowledge mobilization, research, monitoring is all very, very important to inform uh, management needs uh, and, and find management opportunities. But people's attitudes and, and uh, influencing people's attitudes towards bats is very important as well for public outreach and engagement. And because we're working with people, bats live in people's homes. Uh, we're working with industry like pest control industry, roofers uh, is, is something you heard about. Um, it's important to understand all of those facets and uh, it seems like we already have the people in Canada addressing all of these things. So as I mentioned um, in the in the, when the opening remarks, uh, a national workshop right now of course is not possible, um, but we will be working towards that when it is possible. In the meantime, uh, CWC will continue to help our partners manage uh, bat populations from this bat health perspective. That means that the, the White Nose Syndrome Interagency Committee and Technical Working Group structure that you might be familiar with, we're going to reorganize that to really focus it uh, on bad health uh, and to, to build a team that will help to facilitate uh, a national bad health program. Um, so with that, I think I've, I've said enough for now. Uh, we have uh, about 12 minutes left on the agenda for questions. So uh, feel free to uh, unmute yourself and, and state your question or, um, or if there's anything you'd like to discuss, we can do that here. Uh, be mindful of the time, give other people time as well. If you'd rather uh, put it in the chat box, that's fine as well. Uh, then I, I can read it out. So um, I'll open it up for discussion now. And perhaps it was such an avalanche of information that everyone needs some time to digest it. I, I have a comment. It's uh, and a question. It's Diana Geekis, and I just I was uh, this is kind of a detail, but I was interested about the mercury uh, 
contaminants that um, Tom mentioned for the Yukon. And I find it interesting because we're seeing it in um, predators on the west coast, it's bioaccumulating, and then with polar bear, and then um, science and technology and ECCC is looking at it, I understand, for wolverine. So I'm just wondering if you know the um, exposure. Uh, so on the west coast, it's they're attributing it to fog. Um, so I'm just wondering about that. Sure. Uh the, the exposure is the uh, obviously with mercury, it's atmospheric deposition and it's the circul air circulation. So what was interesting about that work, I think, is uh, and, and maybe relevant to some of the other work we may do is uh, it was a lot of combining samples to really get that whole national picture. So that paper, the reason why I flashed it up was that it was a whole lot of people that combined our samples rather than just talking about mercury and bats uh, in the Yukon. We talked about it at a national level. And uh, you mentioned the Wolverine project. We're doing the same thing there, where we're looking across, uh, across the North American Arctic with Wolverine to get that broader picture as well. So the, uh, besides the details about the mercury uh, in bats itself, I think it's a really nice case study of, of this, the bigger stories we can tell when we work together. So just to clarify with the bats, is it is it through their, the insects that they're eating? Is that the idea? That's the idea and, and also the water they're drinking. So it's okay. being in some of the some of the groundwater in the in the lakes and ponds. Okay. And there's similar work been done in Nova Scotia looking at uh, different mercury levels and different water bodies that uh, bats are utilizing. OK, thank you. I'll uh, address a quick question in the chat box. Uh, question, where can we find the recording? I will uh, share the recording with all of those who have registered uh, with an email directly, uh, but I will also share the recording through my regular newsletter uh, and with my interagency network. So it'll uh, it'll definitely find you. Um, there's also a, a comment from, from uh, Susan Holroyd uh, relating to Scott's uh, presentation uh, where she says that when talking about rabies uh, to please avoid using the word carry uh, because bats die from rabies and carry implies that bats fly around with the disease for years um, and also that histo is not uh, doesn't seem to be an issue in BC and Alberta so over there they try to minimize uh, that as an issue to flag in the west. I'll just I'll just quickly uh a comment on that in that uh, bats, not all bats that get rabies die of rabies necessarily. And there's lots of serological evidence in bat colonies that bats have been exposed to rabies and are not currently affected by rabies. So that's something very interesting about rabies in bats is that uh, there is evidence that they could survive infection. Um, the other question, I'm not sure what that means, that histo is not an issue in BC, so we try to minis minimize that. I'm not sure what that means. Hi, it's Susan. <laughs> uh, yeah, we it just that some people, uh, the homeowners are quite concerned about histoplasmosis in the West, and we really, there's, it's not been uh, found in British Columbia, and we have like one record of it in Alberta. So. Uh, we try to minimize that as an issue for homeowners who have bats in their buildings. Yeah, and that's a fair a fair comment to make. And uh, that issue with histoplasmosis in uh, Alberta, was it associated with a uh, bat or was that the golf course issue where it was more likely associated with birds? Um, it was found, yeah, so it was more of a, I'm, I'm not sure what the source was, but it wasn't really a bad issue. All right. Hey, uh, Jody, I, it's Andrew Lush here from PEI. I have a question. It's great to see all these organizations working on bat conservation and uh, our watershed group, along with the Watershed Alliance on PEI, is starting to work on a project. Is there a place where we can find out where all of these organizations are and uh, and what they're doing? Because uh, in some cases we don't know. I'm, for example, the National Park is also doing work in our watershed. We only found that out the other day. I'm wondering if, it, if there isn't, is it worth setting up a central database of who is doing what across the country? Uh, 
I wonder if that's um, also a question for maybe Mike to address, uh, not not to put you on the spot, but I know uh, that through uh, the bets being uh, endangered through the recovery strategy, there is a list of some of these activities uh, that are already going on. Are there updates uh, published on those? Uh, Jordi, could you please just repeat the initial uh, what updates you're looking for? I was reading and responding to a different comment and I was, <laughs> and sure. so I, I lost you here, sorry. Um, and, and Andrew also correct me if I'm misinterpreting your, your question, uh, but the question is on, on and all of these activities that are going on and I, I, I suppose it's not just about recovery strategy uh, activities, but uh, activities that we've heard about today and other uh, activities relating to bad health, uh, whether there is a central place to find out which activities are going on. Yeah, so I can address that there are as far as ECCC is concerned, we do have a, a, a big list of projects that we're working on and, and I think it was slide five of my, I just identified a couple projects that were sort of in the calendar year for 2021 and so those may be uh, contracts and or grants and contributions and so there are a significant list of projects that have gone on and that are kind of going on at the moment and so that would take some preparation I'm not sure necessarily where that exists uh, uh, where it's available to the public in one central repository but I can look into that from from the federal perspective sure and uh, additionally uh, a part of, of, of I suppose my uh, job responsibilities is to to um, get people in contact. So we don't necessarily have a, a list or a database of all these activities that are going on, uh, but part of our responsibilities are to um, to make sure that everyone is kind of up to date on uh, on these sorts of things. So th that's what this webinar is for, for example, but there's lots more going on. So especially if there are specific topics, uh, research topics or outreach topics that you're looking for yourself or wondering if anyone is doing it, uh, always feel free to shoot me an email or give me a call uh, and I'll uh, get you in touch with the right people there. Does that answer your question, Andrew? Yes, it does. Yes, it helps anyway. Yeah, but like I say, there are other other organizations like Parks Canada who, who are also doing research um, and I'm sure there are others that we haven't heard of yet. So it would be a good idea possibly to have some kind of uh, central list or database or even just a discussion group which everyone can join. Absolutely, yeah, and we, we can definitely uh, facilitate those sorts of calls. All right, thanks. And you uh, be, I believe Cynthia just, uh, Cynthia Pickerick just posted up a, uh, a link to all some of the projects that will illustrate what projects are being funded at the federal level. Perfect. I'll, uh, I should be able to uh, keep a record of what's in the chat box, so I'll, I'll pull that out. Um, there are a lot of questions in the chat box. Uh, I think we might only have time for one, so I'll just go in, in order that they are here. Um, from Bruce Rodriguez to Craig Willis, uh, can heated bed boxes interfere with torpor and delayed parturition when outside temperatures are unfavorable for food availability? Yeah, and I'll just answer quickly because I tried to answer in the chat as well in case we run out of time. The short answer is yes, uh, that's a great question. I think options are important. So we put all our heated bat boxes very close to an existing roost with bats in it. So the bats could use our bat house or they could go back to their original colony. Um, that could have been colder. If there's no food around, it doesn't make sense to stay warm. But even at a body temperature of between 25 and 30 degrees, a bat will still save a ton of energy using shallow torpor. So as long as they're not too, too hot, um, you can probably strike a good balance. Great, thank you. Um, <clears throat> just scrolling down, uh, Megan was following up on Andrew's comment um, on whether we could list contact information for all of the speakers from today. Uh, I think that's very useful, uh, so I'll include that um, Somehow, <laughs> I'll, I'll get that to the participants uh, so that you can contact these speakers directly. Uh, but obviously, as Andrew mentioned, there are many, many more. Um, and uh, and it, I think it just shows too how much interest there is for this topic uh, and how we, we do need uh, these forms of communication among each other as well. 
uh, and I think eventually the the workshop that we are hoping to provide will uh, will help with that. Really providing that um, uh, figuring out for ourselves really what is already being done and which resources are out there as they relate to pet health. So with that, looking at the clock, uh, we really only have a couple seconds left. So I'll have to wrap it up here. Uh, thank you very much, everyone. Uh, this is definitely not a one off. This is not the end of, of our discussion on bad health. We will continue this discussion and, as mentioned, uh, continue working on uh, getting a team together to facilitate a national bad health program. As mentioned, I'll uh, distribute the recording of this webinar. Um, unless if any of the speakers have any issues with anything, let me know. Uh, we can figure that out. Um, and um, you'll be hearing more from us. So thank you very much to all the speakers. Your timing was all very great. Um, and thanks for everyone for participating, asking questions, listening in. Have a nice afternoon. <laughs>